Good morning. Well, I can hear that the mics are working this morning. I want to apologize for the last few weeks. Um, we found out last week that one of the, the parts of our soundboard wasn't working, and so we, we've changed that. And then as I think as we pushed back in the, the um, kind of some of our equipment, it kind of unplugged, so we didn't quite have the volume last week either, but it appears it's all working. So um, thank you for um, sticking with us through the little bit of technical problems that we've had. If you're online, it sounded wonderful to you the whole time, so lucky you. Um, it's just been a little quiet in here sometimes, so I'm glad to have that up and working. Uh, I'm grateful to be gathered here with you all this morning on this St. Patrick's Day, seeing um, all the green as we remember St. Patrick, um, who is a, a saint um, in the church who brought um, Christianity to Ireland and spread it there. And so we, we give thanks today. That's It's not just about going out and having drinks with your friends. It's about remembering um, the, the wonderful work um, of the ministry of of St. Patrick in Ireland and the, and the spreading of Christianity. And so as we gather this morning, um, I just want to lead us in a few announcements before um, we get going, and then I'll open up the floor here. So we have a board meeting this Wednesday at 5.30 here at the church. And then coming up uh, next week is already Palm Sunday. Um, and so... I don't know how that happened, but it's true. Um, so our Palm Sunday service will be at our normal 10 o'clock. Um, we are going to then have an Easter egg hunt for um, our children after church. And so if you have um, any uh, candy you'd like to bring, you can bring that um, throughout the week or um, early next Sunday, and we'll make sure that we get that ready, and our youth will go ahead and hide eggs um, for our children. So make sure you come um, to participate in that. And then that brings us into Holy Week. Uh, we have a busy schedule. Um, our, my hope is to try something new on Monday, Thursday. So um, we are going to have um, a potluck meal. So I'll be providing some, some roast beef. Um, and then if people want to bring some sides, um, that would be great. What we're going to do is we're going to gather together and we're going to share in a meal. And as we share in this meal, um, we're going to have um, kind of a reenactment, a skit of uh, the Last Supper, of Jesus's last night with his disciples as he shared in a meal with his disciples that night, just as we're sharing in a meal together that night. So um, I have a sign-up sheet um, out in the uh, out in the, the narthex looking for people who are willing to read on uh, Monday, Thursday. This is not going to be a big commitment. We're, if we practice, it will be like just real quick. It's just going to kind of be a get a script and read it, so I'll send it to you, read it over, and then come in. It's, I'm not expecting um, you to memorize your lines and all of these big things. Um, it's just a way for us to tell the story um, in a different way. So if you are interested, please sign up in the back. Um, if not, I may be contacting a few people. Depending on how many people we have, well, depending on how many um, readers we have, but I, I, would, I probably need at least five um, readers, and right now I have two. Um, so there's a few more. And then the next night, Monday, or not Monday, Monday, Thursday, now we're on to Good Friday. Um, oh, the Monday, Thursday service will be at six o'clock in the fellowship hall. And then Good Friday service will be at seven o'clock, and that's going to be here in the sanctuary. Um, we're going to have what's called a tenebrae service where we hear some scriptures um, leading up to Jesus's last moment, and we extinguish candles as we remember um, the darkness that is about to overcome the world. And so as um, we come into this time, I just invite you um, to, to consider joining us that night for a very powerful um, and and moving service. Um, and for that one, I'm also looking for readers. For this night, I need seven readers um, to read different scriptures um, of our stories. And so if you're interested in that, um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back for that as well. And then that's going to bring us to Sunday, um, Easter Sunday, uh, where we get to uh, rejoice in the resurrection of our Lord, where we will have two services. Our first service will be at 7 a.m. 
um, out at uh, Walnut Hills Cemetery. Um, we'll gather there and remember um, the, the sunrise and uh, the Easter morning in which the women found Jesus at the tomb. And then we'll have breakfast at 9 o'clock, um, which Kathy will give us a little bit more information about here in just a minute. And then we'll have our normal service at 10 o'clock. Uh, that's kind of the schedule coming up. There's a uh, Holy Week is a really busy week, but it's a really great week to experience um, a lot of emotions and a, and a lot of the big stories of our faith. Palm Sunday is a joyful Sunday where we, we bring, we remember Jesus coming into to Jerusalem as people yell at the top of their lungs, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, coming to Monday Thursday where he shares a meal with his disciple to Good Friday where he is crucified, and then Sunday where we get to live into the resurrection. And so I really want to invite you to join us for all of these um, wonderful services. So those are the announcements that um, I have this morning. I'll, since we were just talking about that, I'll invite Kathy to share um, about uh, Easter morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to do an Easter breakfast like we did last year and years prior. And so we need people to sign up to bring various items. We're going to do breakfast casserole and then um, some cinnamon rolls and then fresh fruit and juices. And so I've got to sign up in the back. And if you're going to do a breakfast casserole, if you could also like let us know what kind, whether it's sausage, ham, you know, whatever, um, just for planning purposes, that would be great. And we will need that food here um, by 8.30 that morning so that we can have everything prepped and ready to go. And obviously the breakfast casseroles need to be baked um, when you bring them. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other announcements? The youth group is doing a RU1 of 144 as a fundraiser for our mission trip this summer. So if you would go out into the foyer after church and grab an envelope and deposit the corresponding number, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We have other announcements? I just want to remind everybody we will have a funeral planning seminar right after church. And the purpose of it is, is just to give you information that you may not know. There's been a lot of changes that have taken place since COVID hit us. And I know that one time is not always a good time. So if anybody needs any other time, personally, I'd be happy to do that as well. So if you can make it fine, if not, we'll try to set it another time that doesn't work. Good luck to you. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Bob, for um, sharing your time and uh, this, this knowledge that you have with us this morning. Are there any other announcements this morning? If not, um, then we have a few birthdays um, to wish this week. And so we want to wish a birthday to Loretta Neely, whose birthday is the 19th, um, and Carly Bluebaugh, whose birthday is the 23rd. So happy birthday to our birthdays this week. Do we have any other birthdays in the coming week? If not, then I invite you to rise as you are able, embody your spirit, and join in our call to worship. God's mercy floods over us. Lord, wash me clean of the pain in my life. God's love pours into us. Lord, pour your whole into your pour of my being. Let the love and mercy of God reign in your heart today. Be with me, Lord, and guide my life. Amen. I want to invite you to remain standing as you were able and join in our opening hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, number 203 in the hymnal.
You may be seated. Please join me in the unison prayer. Compassionate Lord, forgive us when we falter on this Lenten pathway, when the road ahead seems too uncertain and we are afraid. We admit that following Jesus is not an easy task. Jesus requires us to be willing to make the ultimate commitment of our whole lives and we hesitate and hold back. Draw us back to you, Lord. Give us confidence and courage to face the future with hope. Let us place our trust in you that the message of peace and mercy you have given to us through Jesus Christ may be offered to others through our own witness to your healing mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This brings us to a time to share together with one another the joys and concerns that are on our hearts this morning. Um, I want to lift up, um, so last night, um, Ashley Hansen's grandfather, Lloyd Hansen, passed away. Um, and so we pray for Lloyd, his family, um, and Ashley and her family um, as, they grieve, as they grieve this loss. Do we have other, uh, we pray for those who um, were affected by the storm this week for any damage that would have been done. Um, we just pray for um, all of those um, in, the, in the path of the tornado and the hail um, and all that came down on us this week. Do we have any other joys or concerns this morning? We have an online one from Peggy Blanding. Her son, Randy, is going to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota to get a second opinion for his cancer. So prayers for Randy. Yes, we pray for, for Randy um, as he goes to a Mayo Clinic to receive a second opinion. Uh, uh, Silver Lake graduate, longtime teacher, Silver Lake Rick Blush. His wife passed away Wednesday, Sandra. So we pray for Sandra and we pray for um, the, the Blush family as they grieve their loss. I'm assuming a lot of the congregation are friends with Stephanie Seth, but she has been going to Mayo Clinic as well to try and figure out a lot of issues she's had. So keep yes. her in your prayers. Yeah, we pray for Stephanie Seth um, as she is... Um, trying to figure out what's going on with her as she's back and forth from Mayo Clinic and other doctors. Uh, we might keep Brad Bryant in our prayers. I saw where his sister had passed away this week. Hmm. Prayers for um, Brad Bryant and his family and the passing of his sister. Are there any other joys or concerns this morning? If not, then I would invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. God of grace and light, we come before you today to gather in this space to be reminded that we are connected in your holy name, that we are connected in your works and in your love, and that when we come here, we put aside who we are in the world and we come before you just as your, your children, as brothers and sisters in Christ. As we gather here today, we gather in a space where we are able to be our true selves, where we are able to open up our hearts to you and to one another and to share in the joy of communion of fellowship. We are reminded today that we come with many burdens on our, on our hearts, that we come carrying the, the weight of the task that we have to complete throughout the week and throughout the day. We come with our minds clouded and foggy in different places, but as we gather here, we take a moment now to just lift up to you those, those things that weigh on us, those things that are preventing us from being fully present here today, from the tasks coming up in front of us, from uh, the, the concerns that are on our hearts, from um, just the, the, the uh, inability today to just clear our minds. We just take a moment to pray to you now for you to, to give us guidance and, and clear our thoughts as we gather in, in front of you to this day.
Lord, now that we are able to um, lift our shoulders and be in a relaxed position, we begin to um, examine the places um, and the people in our lives where we just see your need um, for intervention, where we see people who are grieving the loss of loved ones, where we find um, people who are experiencing sickness and trying to find answers. We just um, say a, a prayer to you, Lord, for all of those that we have lifted up this morning. And we take a moment to, to lift up those people who are on our hearts and in our minds this morning who need your holy presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We are reminded that, that not only do we lift up um, prayers to you when we are in pain and hurting and for those in need, but that we lift up prayers to you for every, every great thing and every rejoice that comes in our lives. And so, Lord, we just take a moment to lift up to you um, the many wonderful things happening in our lives, for the ways we have reconnected with new friends, for the ways that we have experienced the warmth of the sun on our face, from the ways that we have um, just encountered your holy name. So we take a moment to lift up to you the many joys which fill our lives. Lord, we thank you for celebrating with us and being with us, not only in the low moments of our life, but in the high and also in the mundane. As we gather in this space today, Lord, just allow your spirit to gather in with us. Allow your spirit to um, speak through your word and to allow us to experience your living word, to see the way which you are calling us to change, to be different, to be more like Christ. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to remain seated and join in our next hymn, Just a Closer Walk with Thee, number 2,158, in the faith we sing.
Our scripture readings this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 13 and 16. Please rise in body or spirit for the reading of the scripture. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be my prince over the people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of God's word. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite many of our children that would like to to head off to Sunday school at this time. Lent is a season of our Christian year where we get to take a closer look at ourselves and our relationships, both personally and as a community with God. Today's scripture brings up a biblical character who does a great job of reminding us of the nuances of our life as Christians. So today we are continuing to explore the covenants which God has set before us, and today we hear about God's covenant with David. So I want to um, just lift this up to you all and see um, what do we know about King David. What are some of the stories we know from the Bible about David? Yeah, David and Goliath. Can we remember? David and Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba. Yes. Do we know anything else about David? How he danced before the Lord. He danced before the Lord. Did I hear something else? He was a shepherd. Yeah, so David, um, another thing about David, David was one of the kings of Israel. Um, so David is a very prominent figure, particularly in the Old Testament. So we first meet David as a shepherd boy. It's, he has come, um, and God is looking for a new king. Saul was established as the first king over Israel after God had said time after time again, you do not need kings like the, earthly, um, like the other earthly people. You have me to be your God. But the, the Israelites continued to say, I think we need a king, God. God was like, well, I guess I'll give you one then. Here's Saul. He anointed Saul, and Saul came up into power. Um, and Saul did great at the beginning, but then Saul really turned a corner and became um, a bad king, um, an evil king, as he's described um, at the end of his reign. And so as he began to turn and kind of become, his humanness began to take over, there was a need for a new king throughout Israel. And so God said to, to Samuel, the, the prophet, and said, go and find the family of, of Jesse, and there I will give you my new king. And so he goes and he shows up, um, and he meets Jesse, and he says, Jesse, bring before me your sons, because, the God, because God has called me to come and anoint one of your sons as the next king of Israel. And so Jesse has seven sons, and he brings his six oldest sons before Samuel, and they walk in front of him, and each one that he walks, Samuel is like, the Lord is not speaking to me. So they get through the six sons, and or seven sons, sorry, I, was, I had the wrong, um, I thought Samuel was the seven, Samuel was the eight, so the seven sons, they brought through the seven sons, and then all of a sudden, Samuel's like, none of these are who God is calling. Are you sure you have no other sons besides these seven that you have here? And Jesse says, well, my youngest boy is out in the fields tending the sheep. And so um, he says, uh, Samuel says, well, we shall wait and he shall come um, and be with us. 
And so David comes from tending the sheep, and as he walks in front of Samuel, God tells Samuel that this is the one to anoint. And so Samuel anoints David as the next king of Israel, while Saul is still the king. This kind of makes um, a little bit of, a, of Saul really thinking about what's happening here. And so it's, it's very uh, likely that Saul found out what had happened. And so he actually invites David to be a part of his court. Not to raise him up as king, but to keep an eye on him so he's real close. You know, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. That was kind of his thing. And so Saul um, begins to have David work underneath him. And while working there, there's a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites, and David is delivering a message to the army for Saul. And when he gets there, there's kind of this standoff, and there is um, the, the large Philistine Goliath who is standing there saying, Come on, Israelites, is no one going to fight me? And the best warriors of Israel are a little scared to go up against this big guy, but as David shows up, he says, You know what? I'll do it. And so he grabs his slingshot and a few little pebbles, and he goes, and he takes out Goliath with a shot. He then continues to um, work for Saul, and now he's beginning to establish himself as a great warrior. So not only is he defeating Goliath, but now he is leading the battles, um, which eventually actually leads Saul to putting David in charge of an army. Not really because he was a great um, leader, but because Saul was kind of hoping that in the midst of battle, he would die, and he wouldn't have to worry about this person who was threatening his throne. <laughs> Unfortunately for Saul, that didn't happen, and David became an even greater military leader, leading the army to success, um, and being a very successful general, which eventually um, Saul was like, David is doing everything right. I just have to exile him because everything I've tried to get rid of him hasn't worked. And so David spends many years on the run from Saul until after Saul's death. And it is after Saul's death that David is anointed and brought in as the king of Judea. Well, Saul's son, it becomes the king of Israel. So um, the kingdom of Israel, as we think of it now, is kind of split up into two sections. We have um, Judea um, in the, I'm going to get this wrong because I'm thinking about it too hard, in the north, and Israel um, in the south. And so David was over the northern kingdom. Of course, this could be, I'm, I can't think right now. And then um, Saul's son over um, the other. And so they kind of went back and forth, kind of struggling for power, but eventually um, the Saul's son was murdered, and David became the, the king over all of Israel. And he kind of unites the kingdom, and he brings together this nation and expands it through his, his great time as a military leader and really begins to do really wonderful things in God's sight, truly looking to be God's anointed one. It is at this time when David has come into power over all of Israel that we get our scripture today, where we hear this covenant which God is making with David that will make an impact on the rest of the world for time to come, and that continues to be what we live into today. God says to David that, David, I will raise out of your home that you will build a new kingdom. I will raise my kingdom out of an offspring from your home. A home can also mean like a clan. So like, uh, uh, so like his offspring, his people is kind of what this home is it referring to. Then I will take this and I will share with the world the great glory of mine, which I have seen in you, which I have anointed in you, and which I know will come in the future. You know, the thought here is that when he's saying, I'll raise someone up out of, out of your household, out of your clan, that it would be one of his children, that it might be Solomon, um, who we hear, but that ended up not being the case, which we'll get to in just a little bit. So after um, David is anointed and has his covenant made, he is seen um, as this great king, but all great things must come to an end. His humanness begins to get in the way of, of the way in which God has called him to be in the world. And one day he is looking out from his, his castle and he sees a woman bathing on a roof. 
And so he sends um, people from his court to go and get her, and they spend the night together. And in their time together, um, he finds out a few weeks later that Bathsheba has become pregnant, while her husband has been off fighting war. And so David, trying to not be um, the bad guy, to be the adulterous man, at least look like it, he invites Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back um, to be in Jerusalem for a time so that he can spend time with his wife. Although Uriah was a man of great honor, and he was not going to leave the side of his troops and never left um, the, the palace that night, as if his troops couldn't be back with their family, he wasn't going to be back with his family. So David's plan backfired, and now he had to find a new way to make um, this, this pregnancy okay. And so he sent out to one of his generals on the front line and said, hey, Put Uriah on the front line and leave him, um, and kind of leave him by himself, so that he will die on the front lines of the battlefield. Which is what happened. Uriah dies, and now we find um, David has not only had adulterous uh, relations with Uriah's wife and caused her to get pregnant, he has now um, led to Uriah's death. And so David, in this one moment, this person who was the righteous king of Israel, who was anointed while he was just a young boy, has kind of fallen away. And David breaks the covenant of commandments against coveting, stealing, adultery, murder, and false witness all in one swoop. Now that's pretty bad. He at one time broke half of the Ten Commandments just in this one little section of his life. So what hope do we have if this person, David, who was called and anointed by God from the young age of 10 to 12, and was this great warrior and this great king who brought Israel's people together, yet he, even under God's guidance, falls, how are we to be any better? Well, actually, the fact that David is not perfect is what is so comforting. What it shows us is that God, God doesn't just choose those people who will never make a mistake. Instead, God chooses people like David who, they will do lots of wonderful things, but they will also do horrific and horrible things. God doesn't orchestrate the world around us. He doesn't pull the strings like a marionette in every little part of our lives. Instead, God gives us the ability to make the choices. The choices to either follow in God's, in God's path or the choices to sin and miss the mark. That doesn't mean that it's okay when we miss the mark, but it does mean that we are forgiven and God is with us even when we feel that we have abandoned God with all that we are. It means that God will remain faithful and when we realize what we have done, God will be there by our son. So David, after this encounter with Bathsheba and Uriah, he just kind of takes those, those thoughts and puts it under a rug and says, I didn't do anything wrong. I now just have a new wife. Her husband just happened to die on the battlefield. It all worked out. <coughs> and then there was a, a man, um, a prophet, after Samuel had died, named Nathan. And Nathan, it says, he smelled something coming from the palace, and the Lord had kind of revealed to him what had happened with David. And so Nathan comes before David, and he says, David, I have a, a story for you. Can you help me? What should, should happen in this situation? There was a man who, who came to town. He was a rich man, and he came and he took a poor man's goat. He took the best one that they had, and he abused it and stole it for himself. What should happen to this man? And David was like, oh, this man should be put to death. He has stolen the property of another man, and that is what the Lord has told us. And then Nathan is like, that's you! You're who I'm talking about! You did this thing! And David was like, oh, yeah, you're right, I did. And it was one of those things where he tricked him into to seeing the story, to see the story that he had portrayed, but in a different light. And Nathan calls him out, and David 
realizes what he has done. And the thing is that we learn here is that even when we make mistakes, we know that God is by our side, but we can repent of those. The Psalms, many of the Psalms we believe were written by King David, and a lot of those are laments for the way in which he had sinned against his people, and against God, and the ways in which he had not been the holy and gracious king all the time that God had called for. And so David gives us um, this understanding of how we are to respond that when we make a mistake, when either we realize it for ourselves or when it's brought to our own attention, that we are to give that back to God and to repent and to say, Lord, I know that I do not have the ability to do this on my own and that I make bad choices. But Lord, I just pray that you take these from me and that you guide me day after day to make me a better person. And so even the fact that David had done all of these horrible things and will continue to do many things against God's will, God continued to uphold the covenant which God made with David when he was in the height, when he was acting as a just and holy man. That David, one of David's sons, would become a person through whom God would establish God's new kingdom. Well, this wasn't who... They thought it would be. It wasn't Samuel. It wasn't his oldest son who would become king. No, Samuel, or not Samuel, Samson. Samson was also seen as um, a not-so-good king. But it would be about a thousand years after David that this covenant, that this promise to David would be fulfilled. And not only a promise to David, but a promise to the world. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke provide us with a lineage that connects David to Jesus. The fulfillment of the covenant through the Davidic line that would be this new kingdom. Both of them remind us of, of this, this, this thing in different ways. We have um, the actual genealogy in both of them, which takes Jesus to his earthly father Joseph, which relates him back, um, I believe it's 14 generations to David. And we have that out of the root of Jesse, David's father, will come a, a person who will come and establish God's kingdom. This person would be Jesus who would come and live in a new way in the world. We see that the Davidic line, this Davidic covenant that was made, was made right. It was made full in the birth of Jesus on that very first Christmas morning. But it wasn't then that people really realized that this was who was coming up out of the root of Jesse. That this was the Savior who was to be born in Bethlehem. While Mary and Joseph knew, you know, they lived the majority of, of their life just being normal people. Jesus was a normal boy who had chores to do. He, um, I'm sure, wanted to uh, fight back against his mom sometimes when she told him to go take out the trash or whatever, but Jesus was this boy. He learned to be a carpenter um, like his father, Joseph, and that is what he did. But then um, Mary and Joseph, always known because of the intervention with God and some other people maybe knowing that, that Jesus was special. When it was time for him to enter into his ministry, the world was truly changed. People didn't necessarily realize what was happening when he was alive. He was saying all of these things, and this idea of the Messiah coming to us <coughs> was, was supposed to be this great warrior, kind of like that of King David, who would not only um, unite God's people, but would conquer the land in which they were promised. But Jesus wasn't um, this warrior. He wasn't building um, an army to fight people. He was building an army of people who would go out and share the Holy Word and invite people into a new relationship. It wasn't until his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave that it was understood that this was the root of Jesse that would come up and sprout a new kingdom. That would come up and create a place where we can live as a new world and a new people. Jesus came, lived, died, and was resurrected, and this was the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. 
And it wasn't until we began to truly understand who Jesus was, that Jesus was God, who Emmanuel, who came to be with us on earth. And it wasn't him who just came to erase everything that had happened before him, but it was Jesus who said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. God would install a new kingdom on earth that wasn't defined by lineage, that wasn't defined by David's line, that wasn't defined by the laws set before, but one that was defined by a God who, lived, who loves us so much that even when we break every law and when we break every commandment over and over and over and over again, that God continues to reach out to us and calls us home where we can be transformed. A place where we can live apart from the world into a new kingdom that looks radical to everyone else around us. To a kingdom in which we are focused on our love for God and our love for one another as Christ loved us, just as Christ told us to do at, as he spent that last night with his disciples. This covenant in which God made with David reminds us that we too are called by God even when we fall short. That we are called to be a part of this new kingdom which has been revealed to us by Jesus Christ. A kingdom which changes our hearts, which changes the way that we use our hands and our feet and our voice as we live differently in the name of God's mighty love. This is especially poignant here during this season of Lent where we are reminded that we are broken and that we have made mistakes. That we are not always the holy person who lives in to the resurrection and lives a transformed life. But it is to remind us that in this time as we begin to see those places where we have fallen short, that God is beside us and when we repent, that God forgives us. That God places us on a path forward to bring us into right relationship with God and our neighbor. And to be reminded that God is always faithful. And that on Easter morning that Christ did raise from the dead and that we live as a resurrected people. That we do live as a people in a new kingdom which God has promised since the beginning of time. But it took thousands of years to really begin to understand what it truly meant to be God's beloved children, and to begin to understand the love which God has for each and every one of us and the world around us. This is the hope that came from the covenant which God made with David, and it was the hope that comes from us remembering this covenant today. Amen. We come now to a time of living into this covenant, living into this new kingdom where we get to share uh, the many gifts which we have been blessed with to give them back to the Lord. Uh, so as you consider the ways in which you are able to give this morning or to give um, online or throughout the, the, the week, um, just consider the ways in which your gifts are a part of this mission which God established before us. They are part of the mission which invites us to be in relationship with one another, in relationship to our community, to be a place where we can gather. Where we can gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember the love which God has for us. And here on this St. Patty's Day, to think about how um, just as St. Patrick had evangelized and brought Christianity to Ireland, we are here to go and evangelize and bring Christianity to the world around us. And it is through these gifts that we are able to make that happen. And so I want to invite um, our ushers to come forward and receive our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
allow us to experience and extend your kingdom, which you established through Jesus, to the, all those that we meet. To grow in our love for you and to share that love with the world around us. And so we ask that you bless these gifts, that you multiply them, and bring them to us to be your kingdom here on earth. It is in your holy and gracious, loving name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Or no, please remain standing. Sorry. My bad. That was the uh, wrong part of the service in my head. I would invite you to remain standing as you were able and join in our closing song, Jesus Shall Reign, number 157 in the hymnal. remind you that um, at a, about 11.30 we'll start um, our uh, funeral planning session with, with um, Bob Webb, and so I want to invite you to come to that. Also, a uh, reminder, this week um, is election week, so um, there will be elections here at the church on Tuesday, so make sure you come by um, and vote and get to, to place um, your two cents in the election. And so I just, um, as we go forth today, let us be reminded that we are um, God's people that we are a part of this chosen kingdom which God had established through David and which God brings to us today. That even though we fall short day after day and we continue to, to sin, that as we repent, we find grace with God and that we are to go out and to continue to share the love which God has so freely shared with us. And so let us go forth today as the service has ended. You may go in peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.